Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Well, take out your Bibles and look with me to the book of Exodus in chapter 3. We saw last week that Moses, having departed from Egypt, leaving the household of Pharaoh because of fear, because of a concern that it would become known fully to Pharaoh that he had killed an Egyptian. Likewise, that his heart was to the Hebrews and not to the Pharaoh, to the the Egyptians. So once again, we see that Moses is not in Egypt with the rest of the Hebrews, but he's in Midian, We know that he has taken a wife, that he has had a child, and that he is living out his life now, not under God's call, but rather having fled and embraced another another culture and heritage. So we're going to see now that God is going to speak to Moses. So look with me to chapter 3 and verse 1. We begin with this verse, which reads, And Moses was shepherding the flock of Yitro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. Now, two things I want to say about this first section. First of all, we see that instead of Ruel, who we met last week, the father of Sipporah, indeed Moses' father-in-law, we see a change in name to what most of us remember, and that is Yitro, based upon that famous Torah portion that's called Yitro or Jethro. So the first thing is, we see that this man has, and we'll find later on an additional name, but he has two names as of now, Ruel and Yitro. Secondly, we see that Moses, he is in a spiritual household. Notice that Yitro is called a priest. Now, even though that this is a term that's used in Judaism, it can be used in a very generic way. It is not saying that this man in some way is connected to the God of Israel. It's simply saying that he is a servant. The term Kohen can mean servant. And he was a servant, and this may foreshadow the fact that in some way that Yitro is going to be connected with the people of God. Look again at verse 1. Moses was shepherding the flock of Yitro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he was leading the flock, and we have an odd expression, a harha midbar, which means after the wilderness. Now, this probably means deep within the wilderness, that he had taken them far away from where they normally are. That is, that the flock is in a unique location. And therefore, Moses is in that place with them, and notice what it says. And he came to the mountain of God, Horeb. Now, obviously, we're talking about Mount Sinai, Horeb, just like Ruel and Yitro, two names, same individual, also for Mount Sinai. We have that place called by the name of Horeb. And what does that word mean? Well, it means to be very dry or something that is destroyed. It is the same word when we talk about the destruction of the temple, Horban Habayat, that is the destruction of the temple. So it's significant that the place, Mount Sinai, would also be known as a place which means destruction. And some scholars have pointed out 
this may be similar, it may be closely related to what we see back in Genesis chapter 1, where it speaks about the earth being tohu vevohu, empty, void, formless. And what do we find? God's moving to bring about a change. And in that same way that this mountain, it is going to go through a change, not physically, but spiritually. That this mountain, which is kind of a, a broken down, a very dry, arid place, not something that would stand out as a majestic mountain, one that's tall and unique and, and glorious, but rather a simple mountain, one that has been beaten down, but this is the place where the word of God, the commandments of God, and the glory of God is going to be manifested. Now, it simply, I believe, is a, a indicator that God shows himself upon those that have been beaten down, those who feel empty, those who feel dry, and dry scripturally has to do with something that is kind of just worn out, something that is just empty, something that, that does not manifest what it should. And what God is saying here is that through his word, through his presence, in other words, through the truth and the spirit of God, there can be a transformation. This is going to be known as a place for transformation, but it's going to become very significant what this mountain is going to convey to the reader in a moment. So let's look again. It says, And he led the flock after the wilderness, that is that desert, and remember, the term midbar is a place of dependence, a place where one has to trust God. And he came to the mountain of God called Horeb, verse 2. And the angel Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire. Now, not just any angel, but it says Malach Hashem. And usually, when that term, Malach Hashem, the angel of the Lord, appears in the Bible, it's for the purpose of something that is good, for a deliverance. Oftentimes, the context is salvation. And what is related to salvation in this passage? Well, we're going to see it very carefully. But notice what it says in verse 2 that this angel of the Lord, which represents a epiphany, that is a manifestation usually of God's presence. It says, the angel of the Lord appeared, how? In a flame of fire. Biblically, fire oftentimes is seen in judgment. And notice it says, from the midst of the bush, and he looked, that is, Moses looked, and behold, and here's the important thing. This bush, it burned with fire, but the bush, it was not consumed. Now, again, we need to understand and interpret this passage properly. Fire symbolizes judgment. And the thing in Moses gets it right. See, it was not so unusual that there was a fire in the wilderness. No, fires would break out. Remember, it's a dry, arid place, and the heat can be intense, and fires take place. So it wasn't so unique that a fire was seen in the wilderness. What was unique was that this bush was set ablaze, but it was not consumed. Now, this is where it gets interesting because what we find here is a bush that the judgment of God was upon it, but it was not being consumed. It was overcoming the judgment of God. That fire was not having an effect upon that bush. And this is what captured the attention of Moses. It was not supernatural that there was a fire, but it was very unique, very extraordinary, very supernatural that this bush that was ablaze 
was not consumed and consumed rapidly. This is what stood out. And notice what it says here. Behold, this bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Verse 3, and Moses said, I will turn. And this is the important thing. I will turn. Now, it's not the word normally for turning in the sense of repentance, the word tshuva. But this is a word which implies a change of direction, but also this word can be used for removing something, getting rid of something. And now we're seeing an additional hint. God is doing this to get rid of something that was in Moses' life. In other words, as Moses turned, there was going to be a transformation that was going to be offered to this man. Look again at verse 3. And Moses turned, or Moses said, I will turn, please, and I will see this great appearance. Now, two things. It's almost as he's asking for permission because the language is unique in Hebrew. Perhaps in English it doesn't even translate this word na, which is a term of, of polite beseeching. It is a word that announces a request with respect. So when we look here at verse 3, Moses says, and he's speaking primarily to himself, I will turn aside. That's how most English Bibles translates this word, asura. I will turn, please, and I will see this great appearance. Now, another thing that can be mentioned here is that uh, Moses, he seems like he's speaking to himself, but rather he asks permission. And this may, as some of the scholars also point out, show a sensitivity. It's almost as though he's asking God for permission to investigate this happening. Verse 3, second half. He's turning aside. Why? He says, why is not consumed or burnt would be the proper way. You are. Why is not burned this bush? So something's happening, supernatural, and he wants revelation. This is the key. He's going there. He's approaching this because he wants to understand that which makes no human sense, something that cannot be explained naturally. Now, here's the question. Are you concerned? Are you interested is that which is not normal, that which is not of this world, of interest to you? For many people, it is not. They are focused upon the natural. And that which defies natural law, that which is supernatural, they either don't believe in or they reject. Now, things happen in our life that are not normal. God frequently he communicates with people by trying to show them things that should capture their attention, should cause them to turn and seek him. And this is what Moses is doing. So he says, I want to understand why, Madua lo yivar hasne, why this, this bush is not burned up. Verse 4. Now, verse 4 is important because we see what I mentioned several weeks ago, this, this spiritual law of a measure. Now, we know, for example, in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 2, the Word of God says, and Yeshua is speaking, the measure that you measure with will be measured back to you. Now, we could do several messages about that, that principle. But here's, in a very simple way, the significant. God is watching for how we respond to things, what we do. And frequently, the measure 
that we measure with, God is going to turn back in his response to us. Now, if you look at this text, we find here that Moses and the word is emphasized that he looked or he saw, and this caused him to act. And in that same way, look at verse 4, the Lord looked or the Lord saw. So God is doing something. Is Moses going to look at it? Is he going to respond to it? Is he going to be changed by it? And because he was, now God is going to move within the life of Moses. Again, verse 4. And the Lord saw that. He turned to see. That is, he interrupted his life in order to see. And the context here is he was seeking revelation. He wanted an explanation. How could this be? I mean, in the natural, if you set a bush on fire, that bush is going to be consumed. It is going to be burned up. How is this possible? Moses was seeking revelation, and now God was going to do just that. He was going to respond to Moses seeking an explanation for this. Verse 4, And the Lord saw that he turned to see, and God called unto him from the midst of the bush. Now, two things I want to say. God spoke to Moses, that is, he gave revelation to him from this event, not another. Now, what's significant is this. See, God is a God of not just, just diverse variety. That God manifests himself in this way and that way in this religion and in that religion and that spiritual thing and in that other spiritual thing. That's not God. God, one of the things that should come into our mind is that God is unique. He is special. He is different. He is kadosh, that is holy. And holy goes along with the concept of setting apart, sanctifying something, making that unique, making it separate. So here, if Moses was going to encounter God, he was going to have to do it one way. He was going to have to give thought to what he had seen and that he was going to have to go to the proper source. Not just anywhere. Moses couldn't say, well, I want an answer, but I want it where I am. I want an answer, but I want it in this means. No, he had to submit to the source of revelation. So in this scripture, we find that he turned to, to the bush to go there, and it says, And God called unto him from the midst of the bush. And he said, Moses, Moses. And notice his response. That is Moses' response. He says, Hineni. Now, why is this important? Because this is the same phrase that uh, Avraham responded. And we see the patriarchs. Frequently, when God engaged them, when God called them, they said, Hineni, which means, behold, am I, here am I. But here's the important point about it. All scholars agree it is a term of availability. Moses is saying, I'm available. He was spoken to from the midst of this bush that was consumed with fire or burning with fire. It was full of fire, but the bush remained. And Moses heard that voice from that location. Now, he had to know that this was not a normal occurrence. Bushes don't speak. Bushes that are on fire are consumed. They are burnt up, but this one was not. So he says, look at the end of verse 4. Hineni, verse 5. And he said, do not come near here. Now, it's the word halom. Close to our home in Israel is an exit. You know, you're driving on a highway, 
and there's exit ramps. Well, one of the ones that's near my house is the one called Ad Halom, which is the same word. Ad means unto. It's not here, but the word Halom. Hayom, this is hither. In ancient uh, English, it means towards this location, up until this place. So God says something to Moses. In one sense, he's calling him there. He's happy that Moses is turning, changing his life to investigate. As Moses approaches and hears the voice, notice what God says. He says, do not come near to hear. But what is he supposed to do? Remove your shoes from upon your feet. Now, this is a tradition in many different cultures. A few weeks ago, I was in India, and most of the time before a speaker speaks, they will remove their shoes in order to, to give the word of God without their shoes upon their feet. And it may come from this tradition, it may come from another, but it's common. And one of the things that we can just break this down to the simplest understanding. I can remember, and many times when I'm speaking and I ask a question, it's because I want to know the answer. It's not that I always have that answer that I'm looking for, but sometimes I'm, I'm asking in order to literally get a response from people because I want to know what they are thinking about it, what God is teaching them. And I can remember asking, I was teaching, this was years ago, some small children, and I asked them, why do you think God called Moses to this bush that was burning and wasn't consumed? And as Moses responded to learn from God, God said, take off your shoes. And I remember this little five-year-old boy said, he did so to see if Moses would obey his command. I thought that was just a great answer. Because at that same place later on, what was God going to give Moses? The law, the commandments of God. So in one sense, we see that it is a commandment. And it's interesting because God so frequently communicates with his people through commands. We see that certainly in the old, but we also see it dominating the New Testament as well. Now, there's another explanation for this, one that probably if you look in commentaries that you'll see, but removing one's shoes is very common for entering into someone's home, coming into their domain. It is a cultural showing of respect for the purpose of intimacy. And this is something that's being taught. The person, Moses, is being challenged. Will you humble yourself? And if you do, you'll experience my intimate intimacy. I will bring you close to me. You can abode with me, stay with me. And so Moses, he hears this, this command, do not come any closer to here. He says, remove your shoes from upon your feet. Why? For the place which you are standing upon. Now, this word is the word omed. Usually in Hebrew, we have uh, verbs in the perfect or imperfect. Now, do not confuse that with the Greek perfect and imperfect. It means something totally different. Or the English concept of perfect and imperfect. Usually we have a Hebrew verb either in a completed form, meaning it's done, what we might call the past, or in a form that's incomplete, undone, what oftentimes referred to in English as the future. Now, there is debate among Hebrew scholars, primarily Christian Hebrew scholars, that says there's no present tense in Hebrew. They prefer to... to see this construction and call it a participle. 
But I would argue, just based upon uh, what we would call modern Hebrew and what we would look at even ancient Hebrew and see this as the present. But this debate's not important. What's important is this. When the participle, according to Christian scholars, or when the present, it's the same construction, just two different names. But when it appears in the Bible, it's unique. It happens infrequently. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't find it in every couple chapters. We do. But it's relatively, proportionally rare compared to the perfect and the imperfect. And what this does is to show an emphasis. Many of the Hebrew, the rabbinical scholars, they will say when this construction appears, it is to show emphasis. It is to to make this passage emphatic. So let's again see what God is saying. He says, for, middle of verse 5, for the place which you are standing unto it or on it, a love, it says, this is holy ground. Now, two things. It is not holy land. That would be Eretz HaKodesh. But it is actually Admat Kadosh Hu. Adama, ground. So the emphasis is not land as we normally think of it, but ground. Now, this is important because this is the same word, Adama, which the term Adam, man, comes from. What's the relationship here? God is in this location for a purpose. He's sanctified the land, that is the ground. And the ground is from where man has come from, from which God has made the man from the ground and this land has been sanctified and it foreshadows what God wants to do with humanity that he wants to bring kedusha, he wants to bring holiness he wants to bring sanctification to humanity and we're going to see that there is a connection between sanctification and the commandments now here's the problem and people hear that and they get very uncomfortable Because they confuse salvation and sanctification. Is there a relationship? Absolutely. Similar, you go and you want to uh, eat at a restaurant. So you make a reservation. And then you dine at the restaurant. Are those two things related? Obviously. But are they the same thing? No, they are not. Eating at a restaurant is not making a reservation. Eating nourishes you. Making the reservation reservation has no impact on your life. It's only when you consume the food at that restaurant. So in the same way, we are not saved by the commandments. But having been saved, we're going to see that the commandments can have a sanctifying influence in our life. Now, it's important that we understand the terminology because this is what's going to bring about a transformation in our life. When we understand the tools that God has provided for us, and these tools are blessings, they are helps, they give us inspiration and revelation. And I'm speaking about the commandments. See, I can be saved, but that does not mean that I know how I should live, how I should think, what I should do. So the commandments, being saved, applying a commandment to my life, it changes how I live. It changes what I do. It changes how I think. These are sources of revelation. So we are indeed saved by grace. But when we want to understand sanctification, which is related to the purposes of God, it's the commandments, it's the instructions, it's the word of God that that gives us the purposes of God. And this is what we're going to see more and more when we get back to Mount Sinai, 
when we get to chapter 19 and 20 of this book of Exodus. But let's press on. Let's move to verse 6. God is going to give revelation. Up until this time, Moses has heard the voice of God, but, but it has not been defined whose voice this is to Moses. So God introduces himself, verse 6, and he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Yitzchak, and the God of Yaakov or Jacob. And when Moses heard this, notice his response. And Moses hid his face because he, he feared from gazing upon God. So Moses, he believed in God. He had heard of Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, obviously. And now, and this is important, when confronted with God, notice he covered his face, and this is to show not just humility, although the scripture says that of men, Moses was the most humble, but it's also to show a conviction of sin. He understands God is holy, God is righteous, God is perfect, and he's imperfect, unrighteous, unholy. Why? Because of sin. So the thing that Moses is overwhelmed with is the fact that he is a sinner and he is not, uh, it's not acceptable for him to look upon God. Verse 7, and the Lord said, I have certainly seen, it's the phrase, ra'o ra'iti, twice the word Ra'ah in two different forms. The word ra'ah is a word for seeing. Literally, he saw. And God is saying, when it says this construction, I have certainly seen. I have utterly seen, meaning God is very much aware of the situation of the Hebrew people. Look again, verse 7. And the Lord said, and by the way, it's interesting. Because we go back and forth in this passage, which is not uncommon in the Torah, between God, Elohim, and the Lord, the yud vav And the Lord, this is the yud vav And the Lord said, I have certainly seen the oni ami. Oni can be poverty, but in this sense, it's not just a a financial poverty but it's speaking about affliction because this word la note can mean to afflict or torture and most scholars believe that this is being used in a quite inclusive manner an expansive way including all the afflictions both emotionally spiritually physically financially everything the children of israel are suffering and they have been suffering for quite a while but here's what i want you to see it is not until moses comes upon the scene he is god's redeemer and it's only when moses he acts uniquely we don't read about anyone else taking the side of the hebrew people even from those that are among the hebrews They tend to simply take what they're getting, feeling hopeless, believing they're unable to change the situation. But Moses, on the other hand, he seems to be compelled to get involved. And here's something else. When he finds out it might risk his life, Moses flees. God's going to teach him something, that he's got to risk his life if he's going to be the redeemer of the Hebrews, if God is going to use him. And I think that's an important message for all of us. Once more, end of verse 7, he says, I have certainly seen the afflictions of my people. Why my people? Covenant. Verse verse 7, the second half. 
which are in Egypt. And their cries I have heard from before their taskmasters or their oppressors. For I have known his, being the people, his pain. Now, this is so significant. God uses this word yadati for no. So God is saying, not that I'm just aware of, not just that I have cognitive knowledge of your suffering, but he says, I have, and it's a different word. Instead of the word sevil, which is suffering, we have the word for pain, the word koev, hurts pains and God uses it in a different form mak ovav his pain God says I know it but it's an experiential knowledge God is saying here I feel your pain and he means it literally it is painful to God to see his covenant people suffer verse verse 8 Here, God is doing something. All of this gives us revelation in better understanding the gospel work of Messiah Yeshua. For example, if you go to the book of Philippians, and we're studying now on our weekly television show, the book of Philippians. And when you get to Philippians 2, we find that God and I'm speaking about the Son of God, Messiah Yeshua, he humbled himself. And this this idea of humility, this emptying in himself, is seen in a lowering, coming down, and taking the form of a man. And what we see back, look at verse 8. It says, Va ered, and I have come down. This is the important thing. God has come down in order to do something. Le hatzilo, in order to rescue or to deliver. This word, le hatzil, is not the word for redemption. That'll be used elsewhere at a later time. But this is the word for delivering, for rescuing. So God says, I have come down to rescue him, meaning Israel, from the hand of the Egyptians. And here's the key. Not just to set them free from the authority, from being under the hand of the Egyptians, but notice there's a purpose. This salvation, this deliverance, it comes with a purpose. And to bring him up from that land to the land which is good and wide, the land that flows with with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Pezrasite, the the Hivite, and the Jezbasite. So notice here, God's saying, I'm going to deliver the people and I'm going to bring them up to the land. The place of, now he knows it's inhabited. But God is going to take their land and give it to his covenant people. Very important. Because God is able to do it because it's ultimately his land. He is Rebbeinu Sholam, the master of the world. Everything that we do, we do under the authority of God. And these Canaanites and Hittites and Amorites and and so forth, they are going to have to make a decision. Are they going to submit to God or not? Did you know that the land of Canaan, Canaan, is a Hebrew word which means to submit? These people were called to submit. They didn't have to be destroyed. They didn't have to, to leave the land. They could have submitted. But when they refuse the purpose of God, then they are going to be driven out of the land and put to death. But let's go back. God says, immediately on, my plan, my purpose for 
the promise. Now, why am I bringing a promise into it? Because when God manifests himself, notice what he says. Go back up to verse 6. He says, I am the God of your father, the God of Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. All of that is tied back to the covenant, the covenant that God made with Avraham that passed to Yitzchak, to Yaakov, and now to the sons of Yaakov, the Hebrews, the children of Israel. A second important point in regard to the significance of the land being foundational for God's covenant promise. Notice, sometimes we see six, sometimes seven, sometimes eight nations listed, but this time six. Six is the number of grace, and in order to be an inhabitant of the land, you have to be a recipient of of grace. Now, we need to be careful because we're talking about it at this time from an Old Testament perspective. This grace that comes through a Passover experience. What we see in the Old Covenant, it is a paradigm for what we learn in the New Covenant. And that is in the same way that it was a measure of God's grace that brought about the redemption from Egypt and brought the people into the land of Israel in that same way. It is God's grace through not the blood of a normal lamb, but the lamb of God, Messiah Yeshua, that redeems us and brings us out of this world into the promised kingdom. So what we're seeing is a paradigm here. Does that mean that everything happens in the book of Exodus has to repeat itself in the last days? No, we're learning principles. But some of the major things, for example, Passover. The first redemption happened on Passover through a blood of a lamb. And the second redemption took place when Messiah died upon that cross on Passover and shed the blood of the Lamb of God. Look now to verse 9. He says, And now behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me. And remember, what was it that caused this cry? I mean, the people had been crying for a long period of time, and God was silent. What was it that brought about this change? And you'll recall, it was the faithfulness of the two Hebrew midwives. And that's why we find that women are related to redemption. God heard and he responded by offering redemption. And he did so because of the fear and the faithfulness of these two women. They brought about the change. So it says, look again at verse 9. And now behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me. And also I have seen the lachats. That is the, probably your Bible will say oppression, and that's a fine translation. In modern Hebrew, it's a word for stress, anxiety. But let's go with oppression. I have seen the oppression which the Egyptians, they have oppressed you so he is aware of all of this but until certain principles are met until there is a certain one who's willing to submit and play the role of a redeemer redemption is not going to happen one of the things that we need to draw from this passage is that god is a god of order he has spiritual laws spiritual conditions and until those are met Nothing's going to happen. One more verse and we'll be done. And now go. I have sent you to Pharaoh. Now this is important because when we look at this, it's in the what we could call the future, but because the vav is in front of it, it changes it to a pass. He's saying, I have a call for your life. And here's the call. I have sent you meaning it's a done decision. It's not going to change. He's not saying, I'm considering sending you. What do you think about this, Moses? No, it is a foregone conclusion. 
God says, I have sent you to Pharaoh and you will bring forth. Now, it's really a commandment. And you bring forth. So he says, I have sent you and in essence, I'm commanding you to bring forth my people, the children of Israel from Egypt. Now, over and over, God is talking about my people, my people, my people. And again, everything that God's doing, the reason why this is happening is because of this covenant. A covenant that was initiated by Avraham through faith. And that initiated the faithfulness of God. And God is going to be faithful. He will do whatever to bring about ultimately his covenantal promises. But realize something. Who's going to be, re, 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 be the recipient of God's covenant promises? His faithful people. And those who, ultimately, we find that there's a remnant. It is not based upon a birth, but rather it's based upon that same thing, faith. But God is not going to forsake those covenant people. Now, some may be lost along the way because of faithlessness. But God is going to work with the physical descendants of Jacob, a remnant of them, and a remnant of the nations, in order that what he promised Abraham is going to be fulfilled. And what the scripture is sharing with us, and what the book of Exodus teaches us, is that that can only happen through redemption. And that's why the main message of this book of Exodus, what we call in Hebrew, Shemot, the names, it all has to do with teaching the principles of redemption. If you don't understand redemption, you don't understand how God moves, why he moves, and what his moves are going to bring about. Well, I'll close with that until next week. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.